real estate or stocks, property or shares? It's one of the most common questions I get from my investors. Why do you choose to invest in property over stocks and why stocks over property? And that's exactly what I'm gonna be breaking down in today's video. Before we get started, I just wanna say I am not qualified in any way to give financial advice. So this is just one person's opinion. If you take it as financial advice, then that's on you. So first of all, returns. When you compare the returns long-term versus stocks and shares, and when, when we're saying stocks and shares, let's assume we are looking at a, say like the FTSE 100 or the E-mini S&P, which is a, it's a group of companies. And most people, when they first start buying shares or stocks, same thing, by the way, but when they start buying them, usually it's the group of companies. So the FTSE 100, for example, is the top 100 companies companies in the UK. The FTSE 250 is the next 250. And it's very similar around the world. So when we look at long-term returns, they are actually incredibly similar when you net them down. So if you were just looking at the, the returns, it would be very difficult. So say, for example, the long-term average is between 5 and 7%. They actually mirror each other. And if you look at Forbes or indexes, IG index, whatever it is, and you look over the 50-year graphs, you'll find that they actually move quite similar. In the last couple of years, when there was a last hit, I can't say the big C word on YouTube, but we know what we're talking about. When it had that dip, property was impacted more than share prices for a bit longer, but it also rebounded a lot stronger. So in terms of returns, it's very hard to go stocks are better than property or property are better than stocks. So the long term average is very similar. Then what about investment type? And when I mean investment type, I'm talking about the longevity of the investment. What's important with the opinion that I'm sharing today is it's coming from my investment stance. I very, very, very rarely do short trades of any kind. Now in property, sometimes I'll do it if I get a great discount. So you may have seen me, the property in Essex that I got is 160,000 pound flat. I got it for 15,000, that's one five. So I bought that and sold it on quite quickly and made 145,000 gross profit, let's say 135 after all costs. So that is a quick trade. In the same way that when lockdown came into play, um, I did some short trades on oil and some short trades on the market, which again, worked really well. But in general, I am talking about long term investments. My retirement policy is death. I I am not going to sell my portfolio unless I get ridiculous amounts of money for it. So I'm just not going to. I want to hand it to my kids and their kids and legacy and all of that sort of thing. And the same with my share portfolio. So I do have both. I'm just much more heavily invested in property. The overall answer, sorry to be a spoiler here, is it depends. And I know that's not a real answer, but I do want to break down why it depends and what you need to look out for. So first of all, budgets. If you have got a lower budget, then that's going to directly impact which you can even invest in in the first place. For example, if you've only got 10 grand to your name, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to get involved in property straight away unless you look at something called crowdsourcing within property or REITs, R-E-I-T, which is Real Estate Investment Trust. Now, this is not the video for me to go into REITs, but I am going to do a video on Real Estate Investment Trust, the pros, cons, what to look out for, and whether you should get involved in them in the first place. But let's assume we are talking about a bricks and mortar, I want to own that property, and you've only got 10 grand, then you may not have the option to. And so if you've got that budgetary requirement, honestly, at £10,000, you probably are not a financial expert, nor am I, by the way. And so my opinion is I'd probably open up an ISA, uh, a stocks and shares ISA, and then I'd put four grand into a lifetime stocks and shares ISA because you're going to get a £1,000 bonus from the government and buy some stocks, probably the FTSE 100 or something similar for me. And then the remaining 6000 in a stocks and shares ISA separately. 
I use Hargreaves hands down, by the way, but that's by the by. And so I put that away and carry on chipping away. You could put up to 20,000 a year in that completely tax free on all of your earnings. So in budgetary wise, if I don't have enough for a property, I'd probably do what I've just gone through. If I did, I prefer property, which I'll go through in a moment. The next thing I like to look at is risk. It's actually one of the first things I like to look at. You may have heard this term, people go return on investment, i.e. the returns you're gonna get. One I really prefer is return of investment. So before I'm even looking at the profits that I can make, I need to make sure that I'm actually getting the return. So this could be inflationary, it could be economic risk and a lot more. And so I wanna look at the macro environment, which is the larger environment, the larger impact, and the micro environment in the economics of it to understand the risk. And actually, stocks versus properties is very similar until it gets to inflation and the news and this is the well there's loads of differentiators but these are the two real big ones that i don't like so inflation if you don't know is a bit of a hidden tax right it's a spending tax and so it erodes the value of your currency so if i have a pound today and inflation is five percent in one year's time i still have that pound but it's actually worth 5% less. So let's say 95 pence. And you could do the same with dollar and cents or whatever. But inflation is eroding the value of your currency every single second. So now it's worth less. Now it's worth less. Now it's worth less. And so most investors, smart investors, their number one thing is the preservation of capital, i.e. I want to make sure that my money, my financial acumen, um, sorry, wealth is not deteriorating on a day-to-day -day basis. When it comes to property, inflation is kind of your friend, apart from in refurbishments where the costs go up. But say I've got £100,000 property and inflation impacts it by 5% and you've got capital growth on top, well, the value of the property goes up. And so you've got the preservation of capital. And then when you mix in something called leverage, which I'll talk about in a moment, that then times it, it puts it on steroids, okay? So it goes even better for you. Now, news. The news is an absolute killer. I haven't watched the news since probably university, so a good while now. Um, and I really try not to. So even in the office, when the team have got music on, music I'm absolutely fine with. If it's the radio, I don't like it. And I keep turning it off, keep turning, no, I don't want the radio playing. Because I don't want to hear the news. It's so bloody negative all the time. When's the last time you listened to the news and it went, oh, great day today, guys. This is everything magical to happen. Uh, no. Anyway, I'm going to stop before I go into a proper rant there. The reason I'm saying it is a news article can come out about not even the company, not even the company. Let's take Elon Musk, for example, Tesla. He went on Joe Rogan's podcast, smoked a bit of weed, and Tesla stock dropped. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I am. It's fucking stupid. But the point is, he smoked a bit of weed, and so Tesla was suddenly worth hundreds of millions less. Like, how ridiculous is that? How absolutely crazy is that? And that's the problem with some share prices is it's dictated by people's opinions a lot of the time. We have a it's something called a, per, a perfect market hypothesis um, in investing, and it just doesn't exist. And yet, so many investors make their assumptions off of it. But the problem is opinions sway and it can suddenly go down the pan. With property... News can impact certain things. There's media, there's scaremongering and things like that. It's so much more related to that perfect market hypothesis because it's our basic supply and demand economics. Next thing I look at is how they make money. And for me, there's it's not too dissimilar really because a majority of people making long-term money in property, you're making it in, well, three ways, I would say. You've got the capital growth, of the property, i.e. the inflationary impact of it, um, and the fact that it's just more and more demand, way more than supply, increases the prices over time. Then you've got the rental income that's coming in and paying you on a monthly basis, so it's your residual or passive income. 
And then, of course, you've got rental increases because there's an inflationary effect on that, which obviously is more money in your pocket. Most stocks, most shares are very similar. The capital gains or the increase in value of the share price is number one, inflation, but obviously it's, it's more indirect because the inflation in affects the prices that they're charging. They then make more revenue, which increases the ratios and the share price goes up. So capital gains and a lot, but not all, a lot of shares will have something called a dividend. And what this is, is a quarterly, six month, yearly, it depends on the company, payout to the people that own the shares. And this is based on the profits that the company has made. So if the company's made a load of profit, the higher the dividend. The only downside with that is it fluctuates massively. So most of them you can work out ratios and get a yield, if you like, or a return based on the last year's but that doesn't guarantee the next year. So I actually prefer property overall. And yes, I'm biased because I'm heavy in property anyway, so take my opinion with a pinch of salt. But the point is that actually it's more reliable. If I got 500 pounds last month or a thousand pounds last month from my rent, guess what I'm gonna get this month? A thousand pounds. And it's much more likely over time that rents go up it's incredibly rare for rents to drop significantly over a period of time. And then I wanna sort of restate this, how it makes money. So I don't just mean like the dividends, I mean, how does it actually make money? So I've always been told, invest in what you understand. And so property, it's pretty simple. How does it make money? Well, somebody needs a place to live. They're happy to pay me money to live in a house that I own. It's called rent and then I pay off the bills and what I'm left with is profit. Pretty much everyone can understand that concept. However, how does Facebook make money? Let's say I own some shares in Facebook, which I do. And it's like, so if I own shares in Facebook, how does it make money? Well, it's, it makes money off of me by selling my data, right? Um, I always say to people, if you don't know what the product is, you are. So the product on Facebook is you. Every activity, every movement, every time you move your cursor, everything you buy, everything you click on is stored data that is then sold onto other people like me. So as a business, you will see my ads on maybe YouTube or Facebook or whatever it is. And I found that based off of the data that you've shared with those platforms. So I kind of understand that. But then I'm like, well, what's Oculus? What about virtual reality? What about NFTs? What about the metaverse? What about Instagram? What about all of these um, play centers that they've got? All of these stuff where it's like, I don't understand. And so when it comes to the business, it's could I run that business in general? Well, who knows really, but I understand enough to invest in them. But if you look at some of the others, okay, some of the shares that you look at, if I said, who are the top 100 companies in the UK? I can near guarantee 90% plus people that own FTSE um, shares or, or, or in that or ETFs or something wouldn't be able to tell me. And so it really comes down to a fundamental understanding. So what you're doing there is gambling. You're gambling and placing a bet that you think overall the top 100 properties will uh, um, companies will go up which is probably a fair bet, but you don't even know who they are. You don't know what they do. You don't know how they make their money. You don't know how they mitigate risk. You don't know the management structure. You don't know the team in place. So I like boring, you know, in property where I'll say boring, vanilla, buy to let. And the reason I like it boring is it's predictable. There are downsides to property and two of them is number one, they are illiquid. And what this means is if I've got £100,000 worth of shares or $100,000 of shares and something happens where it could be like, damn, I need 30 grand like that, I can go online on my phone, I can put my ugly mug on there, go on Hargreaves hands down and I go, right, I'm gonna sell 30 grand of Facebook. So it's like, right, okay, I'm gonna sell 30 grand of Facebook and see what happens there. 
There you go. Now I've got 30 grand. I didn't do it. But like I've got 30 grand in my pocket or my bank. Tomorrow I can go spend it. If I've got only property, it's very illiquid or certainly less liquid than stocks. So if I needed to go, right, I've got my portfolio. It's all going well. I need 30 grand. Ha. Huh. Right, I need to sell one of my properties. What one should I sell? Let's say I decide quickly. I call up estate agents. Then they come around and take photos. Then they go put it online. Then it's going to take 12 weeks to get in the offers and get it accepted. And then another 12 weeks. We're talking six to nine months before I have that money. Not great, okay? So that's one of the big downsides, I would say, of property where I definitely would pick stocks if my need for money is there. For myself personally, I've got decent money-making potential. So if I suddenly needed money, I'd probably be able to raise it fairly quickly or borrow it from a friend. But if I wasn't in that situation and I'd suddenly need money, then I'd probably pick stocks over property. The other thing is the amount of effort. When I buy 30 grand or 50 grand's worth of Facebook stock, I kind of just leave it. And I understand it will go up. And I understand there'll be dips and I understand I'll get dividends and I understand all this other stuff. But largely speaking, I buy it and nothing. Like, I'm not getting a phone call from Zucks going, Jamie, listen, mate, I need some advice on this. No, he doesn't need to. He cracks on with his stuff, right? Whereas with a property, there's a lot more intricacies. So you need to find the property, which is a ball ache trying to find a, a right investment. Then you need to put in the offers over and over again. Then you need to get it through the legal process and hope that the your solicitor doesn't screw around, your broker doesn't screw around. You, you need to hope that the valuer actually values use it where you need. You need to hope the vendor doesn't change his mind or her mind. You need to hope the vendor solicitor doesn't screw up. And then you need to get a refurb team in and hope that they come in on budget, on time and on quality. And they communicate with you. And then you get a tenant in. And then you need to hope the tenant actually pays you. And then you need to deal with evictions. You need to deal with the boiler going on bloody Christmas day. So it's not that bad, by the way. But it's a lot more effort. It's a lot more time that goes into it and ongoing expense to maintain the property in the first place. The final big one that I kind of touched on earlier is leverage. It's a lot more normal to do this in property than shares. You can leverage shares with um, spread betting and other things, but I recommend against it unless you are a professional and you really know what you're doing. With property, everyone does it. Well, pretty much everyone. Called mortgages, right? So you get a mortgage, let's make the numbers easy, and I buy a £100,000 house, let's assume there's no fees whatsoever. Well, with shares, you'd put in 100000 With property, it's very different. You usually, for a buy-to-let, will only put in £25,000. So in this theory, theoretical example, I could buy four properties with the twenty five grand, giving me a four hundred thousand pound portfolio you might think okay that's cool but no the real power is in the inflationary and capital gains impact so let's say the value of the portfolio goes up 10 percent just as an example it's not 10 percent on the hundred thousand you've put in it's on the four hundred thousand so on top of that return you've then made another forty thousand pounds at the end of year one from the 10 percent growth in the value and so I I much prefer it on property to leverage it and really safely, I think, take advantage of the leverage and capital growth available to me. The final thing and the real test for me that makes this quite a simple choice if I've got one or the other is, well, often you do a mix, you know, maybe 70 and 30. But go into a bank. Imagine going into Barclays and saying, hey, look, I've got this property portfolio. It looks great. The numbers are great. Will you give me a million pounds? And subject to the checks and everything like that, they will give you that money. The banks will give you millions. They are actively trying to get it out there to help you build a portfolio. Now, scenario number two, and it's a bit of a joke, but try it out if you want. Imagine going into Barclays and saying, hey, do you believe in your own company? They go, yes, of course. What do you think of the future? Oh, it's amazing. All of this growth. Amazing. 
Great news, I'm looking to buy a million pounds worth of Barclays shares. I wanna buy shares in a business, in your business, will you give me a million pounds? And it will be a flat no. And you have to ask yourself, why is it lenders will lend so much money for, in order for you to buy property, billions, billions across the world or trillions across the world. But why won't the average bank lend you money to buy shares in their own business? And for me, I, don't, I wouldn't say that says it all, but it certainly says a lot. So that's my opinion overall. Hopefully it's just, it doesn't really matter in my opinion, but hopefully it gets you thinking in different ways. And for me, I'm very heavy in property. Will I dilute it down with shares over the years? Maybe I still top out my ISA, my pensions and stuff like that. But ultimately, I'm very focused on property. But hey, you probably knew that coming to a property investment channel that I might be slightly biased. But if you are looking for help building your portfolio and you've got a minimum of £100,000, I'm going to put a link below. I actually help people build their portfolios for a fee. So there's a link in there. It's apgaspirepropertygroup.co.uk. You can click on that, fill in your details, talk to my senior investment consultant, and I'll help the best that we can to help scale that portfolio. Let me know if you've got value from this video. And by the way, put stocks or shares or property or real estate with what your main focuses and why because this is just my opinion it doesn't mean i'm right and if you got value from this video make sure to hit the like button and if you're new to the channel and you want to find out more about scaling a portfolio and building your property empire make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell and of course i'll see you in the next video